Welcome to this event organized by the Open Rights Group titled Data, Democracy and the Integrity of Our Elections. My name is Al Gaff and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Open Rights Group. I'll be moderating today's event. But before I'll introduce today's panel, I'd like to briefly talk about the Open Rights Group. Founded in 2005 by a group of grassroots digital activists, the Open Rights Group is the UK's premier data and digital rights campaigning organization. Open Rights Group exists to preserve and promote civil liberties in the digital age. As an organization which was founded by grassroots activists, we continue to rely on the generous support of our members and supporters. So if you believe that digital and data rights are fundamental human rights, or if you care about privacy and free speech online, please do consider supporting us by joining the Open Rights Group as a member. You can do that by going to our website now. With only days to go until the US presidential election, here at the Open Rights Group, we have convened an excellent panel of digital rights experts to discuss elections from a data and digital rights perspective. It is my pleasure to welcome our excellent panelists for today's events. Shireen Mitchell is the founder of the Stop Online Violence Against Women project and a member of the independent Facebook oversight board. Mitchell and her team were the first to recognize the Russian digital threats that directly targeted black American voters. Professor David Carroll is an associate professor of media design at the Parsons School of Design at the New School in New York. Professor Carroll's work to reclaim his personal data held by Cambridge Analytica was featured in the Emmy and BAFTA nominated documentary, The Great Hack. And finally, Ravi Naik is the Law Society's 2018 and 2019 Human Rights Lawyer of the Year. He's a multi-award winning solicitor who served as Professor David Carroll's lawyer and was also featured in The Great Hack. In January 2020, Ravi co-founded the data rights agency AWO, where he serves as the legal director. We will now start with opening remarks from Professor David Carroll. It's great to be here, uh, especially just days away from the 2020 presidential election in the United States. And I remember quite specifically uh, in the days after the 2016 election, uh, when I started to connect with researchers around the world uh, in the aftermath, trying to figure out what had just happened and if the data existed to attempt to explain it. And it was in those days that I had met with uh, a Swiss-based researcher, mathematician and European data protection uh, advocate, Paul Olivier de Hay. And he was looking to, in a sense, recruit a US citizen to use, uh, in this case, UK law to try and get answers. And he theorized that the company that did the voter analytics and targeting for the Trump campaign was a UK entity and therefore would be governed by UK law and would grant us rights as US citizens that we wouldn't normally have because of the strange situation that our data was exported during 2016 into a data protecting state, that being the United Kingdom. And all we had to do was perform the so-called subject access request. And that would start a cascade of events that would potentially lead us to finding answers that would normally be out of reach. And so Paul helped me uh, do the data request. And I specifically remember going to datacompliance.cambridgeanalytica.org where I filled out some basic personal information. I immediately received an email from SCL Group asking me to wire 10 pounds for a fee to SCL Elections Limited. And even in just that simple transaction, we had already proven the first hypothesis that we were dealing with a UK entity and the thin facade of Cambridge Analytica came crumbling down. 
Uh, we, of course, were confirmed that we were dealing with the registered data controller uh, for Cambridge Analytica. And we did receive um, some data shortly after. So this was uh, done in sh right before the inauguration of Donald Trump. And we did receive some uh, data and a response in March. I immediately posted a redacted version of that data to Twitter. It caused a lot of interesting attention, including attention from the information commissioner's office and several uh, academics and legal minds in the UK that alerted me that this probably was not lawful. And it was then that I got um, connected with um, my lawyer, my solicitor, Ravi Nayak, who's here with us, uh, who then represented me in a multi-year effort to um, actually get the full data set. We challenged that the data that was provided to us was couldn't possibly be complete. It, of course, didn't match what the company bragged it had but also our expert witnesses also ver ver verified that uh, it could not have been complete. And this proceeded to um, on July 4th, 2017, uh, interesting day, we filed a complaint with the ICO about the failure to respond to our requests for full disclosure under section seven of the Data Protection Act. And then on the weekend before the story exploded in international headlines around the world in the New York Times and the Guardian, uh, we filed a claim um, and we never got our day in court because the company quickly uh, filed for insolvency in the UK and bankruptcy in the US. And so we never got our chance to um, fight what was probably I, what, what I was you know, encouraged was going to be a very strong case that the company violated pr principle one of the Data Protection Act by creating political pr profiles of all registered US voters in contravention to UK law. Uh, it became then a very complicated insolvency case, which although I did not prevail in the end, we did win some victories along the way. And, um, and then we were sort of left with a feeling of, will we ever get the data? And indeed at the end of the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, one of my final cl closing thoughts is that, you know, I'll probably never get my data back. This film was released in the summer of 2019. But then interestingly, a few weeks ago, the British broadcaster Channel 4 knocked on my door and said, Professor Carroll, we have something we'd like to show you. And they showed me the data file that I always knew was there. And it had all of the elements that we ar argued had to have been disclosed. The, um, the data brokers who had supplied the data to Cambridge Analytica SCL, a personality profile, and other predictions about my political beliefs that far exceeded what was originally provided. So again, vindicated that the original pursuit was legitimate, but the question that remains today is why did it take an act of journalism to achieve this? And so we did um, give the data that Channel 4 provided me to the ICO's office asking them to explain this and they agreed to reopen the case, the, to reopen their investigation. And at this point we await their response, how they can explain that channel four obtained the Trump campaign database, which was supposedly what the ICO seized under criminal warrant back in the spring of 2018. So since then, Channel 4 has published some very disturbing reporting about how voters were targeted in battleground states, and in particular, how race was a present element in the database and then was used to mark voters for 
a segmentation called deterrence and that then messages were marked in hopes of suppressing participation by voters of color in places like Wisconsin and Florida. And most recently, Channel 4 partnered with the Miami Herald uh, to show how this campaign appeared to be significant in Florida and probably effective at diminishing the participation of voters of color in a pivotal battleground state. And so the question remains, is the Trump campaign using the deterrence category in 2020? And has the RNC adequately sanitized its voter operation from the scandal of the last election? That is, is illegally obtained data still present in the data models and in the databases? Uh, we don't know the answers to both of those questions. And what troubles me the most is that because the campaign will not make the same mistake that it made in 2016 by exporting our data to a data protecting state, Americans will not have any legal recourse to request their data, nor will a regulator have any jurisdiction to demand disclosure from the campaign. So unfortunately, we may be more in the dark in 2020 than we were in 2016, just as the unusual transnational flow of data created the loophole that allowed us to get some answers and some accountability that we may not be able to get this time. Thank you so much, David. Uh, next, we will hear Shireen's opening remarks. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to share what we got to understand about what happened in 2016, um, why we got to understand that, and our data sort of pre presents those, those aspects as to why we were the first to put out the report that said that no other group was targeted more than, Rush, than, um, than African Americans by Russia. Um, and I use our data sets to explain that, but I want people to realize that we were the first to stop online violence against women incorporated, were the first to actually put that report out despite the fact that the 3,500 ads that came from Facebook to the Senate Intelligence Committee um, had that information as well. And I agree with David in, in so many aspects about the ways in which we do not um, address the data privacy issues here in America in comparison to other countries. Um, and I, that's why his case was so important for us to sort of have a visual about that and how these things work. But the other piece about that is that I think um, I've been in multiple hearings. I've, I've, I've attended um, or participated in hearings on the Hill and watched the way in which um, our Congress, you know, sort of talks to our tech companies about our data and privacy in a way that does not protect us as Americans. And there was a lot of conversation that even happened yesterday where it was more protecting politicians and their right to say whatever they want and, and even in some ways be harmful to uh, Americans. Um, and I think that that's problematic across the board as we start think, thinking about what this is this is going to look like. And I also say that um, we had this information in 2016, at least by the end of 2016. We had the Mueller report that came out after that. Our report came out in 2018, just before the 2018 elections. And yet we as Americans have yet to see or, or find ways to hold our government accountable as well as these tech companies accountable about this, this, this sort of data use. Um, we have defined in our second report early this year what we have seen as digital voter suppression. And the reason why we defined that was to ex get people to understand how often and how much uh, Black voters were being targeted to, to get them not to vote. Now, be clear, this is not new in America. This is a history in America. Russia tried to interfere before and during the civil rights movement. Um, they're just doing a digital version of that. And we defined what that was by defining digital vote suppression so that people understood what they were looking at and ways in which we were trying to get people to be aware of so that we can somehow combat this. And like David, I feel like here we are days away from the election and we have not done that work. And um, I, find, I find that very uh, challenging at this point. So I'm gonna show our data set and, uh, um, as, as I share what we saw back then. What we did was dip what was different from others, revealing this, this is the data set of the 3,500 ads 
uh, from Russia. And as you can see, there's like these highlighted light colored spaces. You see the red spaces that are sort of things that they worked on or, or areas that they were focused on with these ads. But um, you can see it's sort of a little bit of intensity in terms of the nodes. But the overall intensity, as you can see with these lighter colors um, here is how we figured this out. So we took the data set and looked at it from a data, data perspective. These are the same 3,500 ads the Senate had. There's the same 3,500 ads that the Oxford uh, University had. We looked at this very differently because we saw that, that we were the main targets. Every, you know, media companies and everyone else who received them said that race was an issue. But we said that it was more importantly to understand what race and when. So as you see this web that's connected here, I'm gonna show you more details in here, but the outside of this web here are the things that are also key and important. Because why? Because we see that despite this web, uh, groups like Chicana and Latino, as you can see here, are outside the web. They were not connected to the things that Russia was using to suppress the vote, uh, but they were still targeting other groups. And we use that as an example so people understand that when you look outside the web and you see this small uh, use of, of their ad base, and then you see these others that are big intense ones here. So I'm going to zoom in on another one here. So you can see that we were connected to issues around Islam or Muslim. Um, this was a, a key part of what they were using um, in terms of um, suppressing the vote and also groups that they were targeting. As we can say, you know, people said that, oh, there were different groups, there were different ethnic groups, there were different um, issue areas, and that's very true. Um, but what you can tell by the way this node is connected across the board um, in these areas, you start to see a pattern here as to why, right? Here's Julian Assange. You see other aspects, you see Ron Paul. Um, you see Mike Savage, you see Mike Huckabee, you see Sean Hannity, you see the ways in which Tucker Carlson, um, of course, there are Breitbart, you see all these aspects that are connected here. And, and why we knew what was going on was different was when we decided to zoom in on this level of intensity, which is hard to read, um, you can see that they were focused on African American, although it's hard to read, I'm going to click on one here. And you can see that this one is African-American history. This is the number of each of these ads. This is the level intensity for that one aspect that they were connecting. And these are the impressions and the amount of clicks that they got for them. So we use this as to explain to people, this is why we figured out why African-Americans in, 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 in early in, in 2018 were the ones that were focused on. Because you can see how they not only used our identity here, but then they used it to weaponize it against other groups and other issues. That we were not just on our own island. We were connected to all the other issues. And so after we looked at this, we started to realize that there was a pattern here. And we now know, fast forward, I'm gonna stop sharing now. We now know, fast forward, now with the with what happened with Channel 4 News, uh, that not only did the Trump campaign, which by the way, we also knew. We knew because uh, in 2016, uh, they basically said um, from the from their project Alamo, uh, which goes back to David, um, the digital arm of the of the Trump campaign called Project Alamo, run by Brad um, Pas Pascal and excuse me, Jared Kushner, had face had a Facebook office sitting there, had um, and this is you know reported by the BBC, had um, Cambridge Analytica sitting there in the office there. So we know that the same data set that Cambridge Analytica was using um, was also s connected to some of these issues. And, and we know this now in 2020, unfortunately, because of the expose that went out around Channel 4 News that not only gave David his information, but then revealed how detailed they went down into the campaign to come after Black voters all the way to the county level. And, and Brad Pascal had said in 2016, they had a three-tier voter suppression uh, campaign. And in that three-tier voter suppression campaign included African-Americans. We now know they called it deterrence, but that was their target then. And I am 100% sure that target has not changed because we've been tracking since early this year about what's been happening to Black voters. And we've watched all those patterns. We've also watched what the campaign has been doing in ways in which they're getting celebrities, especially Black celebrities, to sign on so they can help suppress the vote. But in our, in our report early this year, we showed that there were already five campaigns that had 
that only one purpose and one purpose only was to tell black voters not to vote for the Democratic Party. In January, they had no idea who the candidates were going to be. They had no idea who the nominee was going to be, but there were already campaigns in existence targeting black voters to tell them not to vote for a Democratic candidate, period. That in itself should have been an alarm for all of us to be paying more attention and, and for actions to be taken on the platforms and otherwise, and that did not happen. So here we are days away, but we've seen those campaigns um, expand into other groups. Uh, we've seen hashtag targeting, and we've seen the, the same weaponization of 2016 that was used by Russia being amplified by domestic actors. So both the same aspect that we identified in 2016 that worked for Michigan. One state that we use as an example to prove our point, 90K people went through the physical hurdles in America for voter, that, that, that are set up to them for voter suppression, i.e. moving polling places and the like to get to the ballot, cast their ballot, and then not vote top of the ticket. So they left the top of the ticket, i.e. the presidential race blank because that campaign from Russia that said that these both these candidates are the same worked. Not only did this happen in Michigan, it also happened in Detroit specifically, a predominantly Black environment, 70K people did the same thing. He won that one state by 11K. So we've said over and over again, we need to define what digital voter suppression was. So we got to the places that were illegal, the aspects that were being shared that should be shut down before the election. And unfortunately, we have not gotten there because of um, our current government stat uh, uh, strategy to make sure that you know voter suppression, which is normal in this country, is still accepted even when it's digital, when it's in its digital form. So telling people now what we've he hearing from politicians about where the vote, what, uh, that their ballots won't be counted, ballot boxes being targeted, people being told different information about what they should and should not do during this election, targeting black voters or using COVID as, as, as weapons. All of this is part of the disinformation that we knew was coming even before we even knew COVID was gonna show up in March. Thank you so much, Shree. Very, very interesting and of course, um, outrageous as well uh, on so many different levels. Now, um, uh, I think now's a good time to go into discussions and question and answer. Uh, people have sent us tons of questions, around 150 questions, and I've grouped them together and I've come up with, 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 with themed questions, so to speak. Uh, and I'm gonna pose those questions to the panel. So feel free, feel free to, uh, to come in, please. Um, now, one of the key things that has come through uh, from the remarks uh, from the speaker is the differences in terms of privacy legislations uh, and the standards between the United States and the United Kingdom and, of course, the EU. Um, one of the questions that has come through um, a number of times from a number of our audience refers to the role of uh, the British Privacy Regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, and how they have fared throughout this whole uh, investigation or throughout this whole journey from, uh, from the start when um, Professor David Carroll uh, started his journey of trying to reclaim his personal data, uh, up until recently where the Channel 4 has successfully managed um, to uh, see and reveal the data um, on David. Uh, but of course, uh, we have not seen the same from the ICOs. So I was wondering if anyone on the panel, specifically Ravi, has had any uh, thoughts on this issue. Yes, I'd be happy to start on this. I'm sure David has some thoughts as well. Um, so there's a few things to say about the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, and how they've operated in, in respect of Cambridge Analytica, but not just Cambridge Analytica, but generally the use of data during our de democratic process. So the first thing is to keep in mind that David's case spearheaded a lot of good action by the Information Commissioner's Office with respect to, to data and democracy. Um, in November, I think it was 2018, we had some reports from the Information Commissioner's Office, Democracy Disrupted, which was a very helpful and detailed analysis of what was happening with data and democracy, some of the concerns to do with those prisons, how the law could be applied, how the law needed to be strengthened, et cetera, and, and further enforcement steps that could be taken. 
and related to this was obviously the prosecution of um, SCL for failing to comply with, with David's um, subject access request. But at that point, and following the work by David on his cases to get the Information Commissioner access to SCL servers, we expected in autumn, I think it was last year, we expected to get uh, an analysis of the data flows across SCL and an explanation, an almost real-time explanation of how SCL and Cambridge Analytica worked as a company so individuals, the public could understand what was happening within this company, how the data was flowing, and how the data would have looked for those that had access to those platforms. In the event, we didn't actually get a report that looked at SCL in that kind of detail. And what we got was a very short a letter from the Information Commissioner's Office to the DCMS committee who had asked questions to the Information Commission about these servers and other matters related to data and democracy. And that letter was very limited. It wasn't the report we were promised. It was a very limited um, letter. And that letter was then reported on as the Information Commissioner making a, a series of conclusions that didn't quite stack up either to the facts as the Information Commissioner had previously explained or they didn't stack up to what we now understand Cambridge Analytica and related companies have done. And there are three aspects to that that I think are worth considering. Firstly, the Information Commissioner had made findings in response to David's case that Cambridge Analytica and their parent companies had breached the data protection laws of the UK. That was a concrete finding by the Information Commissioner's Office that was not contained in this recent letter, which seemed to have lost a lot of scrutiny. Secondly, we did not receive this full report we had all expected to receive in respect of what the data flows were, who was Cambridge Analytica's data given to, how was it weaponized. Thirdly, there was a finding in there about Cambridge Analytica's relationship with Brexit, but what is not denied and has never been denied is that American data was laundered in the UK through SCL and Cambridge Analytica. And this, these are all aspects of this report that seem to be missing from the, the analysis and the recent reporting of what the ICO have said and done over the last two or three years. And I think one thing that's getting lost in the, the discussion around this is because of this illegality and the illegal behavior that we see in Cambridge Analytica, we have to keep in mind that Cambridge Analytica are not one solo company involved in digital democracy campaigns. There are a host of these companies. There are a host of companies that are taking data of people across the world, analyzing them for that they, those data sets for political purposes, constantly building those data sets to allow, uh, to allow richer, more ingrained data profiling activity. And it's a real concern that the Information Commissioner's recent actions have uh, let that industry escape scrutiny. And whether whatever Cambridge Analytica may or may not have done, the point stands that there is an industry that is escaping scrutiny, that is probably acting unlawfully, that needs oversight because 2020 election is days away and we've had no change in the way those those companies and that industry operates. And that's a real cause for concern. Those changes should have happened when David exposed this company for what they are. Thank you, Ravi. Um, David, would you like to add anything to Ravi's remarks? First, I wanted to you know, note that we don't have the equivalent of the ICO in the US. The closest that we have is the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, which is responsible for enforcing privacy issues in the US. But there is no fundamental right of privacy in the US Constitution like there is in the EU Charter, a fundamental right of data protection. And this was the kind of political architecture that was a revelation to me as an American when I first embarked on this pursuit that I had never appreciated as an American that we don't have equal rights to our friends and allies in the European community. And the failure 
to have a explicit right of privacy in the US Constitution is part of why the FTCs is a, a hobbled re regulator that it can barely do its job and that you know every Silicon Valley company has um, engaged in a consent decree with the FTC for privacy violations that it's almost like a sort of coming of age or a badge of honor to have your FTC consent decree. Uh, every tech company has has broken uh, what privacy laws we have uh, and has you know engaged in a settlement and indeed the Facebook um, settlement for five billion dollars uh, is the result of violating the original consent decree. And so it's really exposed the weakness that the US has. And this was included in the final volume of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence report of its Russia investigation, which included uh, witness testimony uh, from inside Cambridge Analytica SCL in which the company targeted countries with weak privacy laws to conduct its business and was deterred from being able to operate in countries with, with data protection enforcement. So for example, the company wanted to operate in French and German elections, but the European model prevented them from entering those markets. Whereas other countries like the US with weak to no rights in this regard provided excellent opportunities. And it should be noted in the letter that Ravi met mentioned, uh, the recent le letter from the ICO to the DCMS committee that they discovered in their investigation that the company was in the process of relocating its operations offshore out of the UK precisely because of this liability, that there is a incentive to exploit countries with weak to no protections and a new awareness that operating in countries with rights and enforcement prevents this business from being legal. And so the sort of transnational flow and pushing into the shadows of these dark operators is a sort of it remains a problem. And um, Ra 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 Ravi once described this to me as in parallel to the problem of piracy and pirates who once uh, exploited international waters to, um, to do their criminality. And it took international cooperation to mostly stamp out the problem of pirates. Now, yes, they still exist in certain places. It's not completely gone, but it's largely a problem that we um, you know, think of as a cartoon pro problem. Uh, but I think the, there are data pirates. There are many companies that do this and they have not been identified. They have not been prosecuted. They have not been deterred. And so mass data abuse will continue until we solve this problem with, through global co cooperation as we basically did with piracy hundreds of years ago. Sorry, I was gonna ask David a question very quickly on the back of that. Was David, I know you touched on this slightly earlier, but I wonder if it's worth us talking about the ICO reopening the investigation on the basis of the Channel 4. Sure, I think, you know, this is a, an aspect that I don't believe the press has reported on, even though I have told reporters about it. There's sort of an allergy uh, amongst reporters to cover the Cambridge Analytica scandal anymore. And I applaud the Miami Herald for cooperating with Chat Channel 4 and bringing the story back to the surface and highlighting the issues that Shireen, uh, you know, also reminds us of that, um, the data abuse that's occurring is, is so far beyond the controversy of so-called psychographics that this is a diabolical effort 
to undermine participation in the electoral process. And the fact that the ICO has allowed itself to you know, not confront this uh, and allowed its remarks in the letter to be used by skeptics to say, Cambridge Analytica is a non-story and psychographics don't work, ha ha, we were right, is outrageous considering what Channel 4 has provided forensic proof of and has done the legwork of going into these voting districts and shown voters their own data and done the, the legwork of showing that Cambridge Analytica had effects. And these effects are contrary to the democratic small d process. And so, so that that's a sort of an outstanding issue and it is, I'm glad we're covering it. And Shireen is right, it's far too late to do anything about it. And we were, we are, you know, on the eve of the next election and the challenge that the investigations and enforcement of this problem take too long. We are, you know, we like people are already voting by the time we get answers. People were already voting when Channel 4 got a hold of this data. And why is Channel 4 getting a hold of this data? I mean, it's great that journalists do their work, but what does that say about the insecurity and cyber operations of these companies? that the data is not secure. And if it can get in the hands of a journalist, then it can get in the hands of anyone, any actor. And so the sort of basic sort of cybersecurity issues are also an issue that I don't believe the press has properly addressed. Uh, and so as we think of you know, election integrity uh, concerns beyond data abuse and the fact that um, hostile foreign states use Americans' voter data against us, and yet we tolerate data companies allowing this data to get into the wrong hands. Um, these are all part of the same problem, and it's been proven now that it can have detrimental effects. So this sort of downplaying of Cambridge Analytica is one of the things that frustrates me the most. And it is, it, is, it is not just sort of partisans who do this, but even fellow academics. Um, and so it's really troubling that the evidence is ignored and the legal issues are ignored in favor of downplaying and being skeptical. And so I, I, yeah, would, just, just... I would just piggyback on that a little bit and say, um, it's not even just um, the aspects of the, the the things that you just said, David, um, because because we, I think in some ways that there's an acceptance of that kind of voter suppression, right? Even though this is new and different in the way that it's being used, um, there's there's some kind of acceptance about that, and that's part of our problem. Um, and you're right, if the media can get it, that means that anyone can get it. So where are the regulations that's protecting us from from these types of things? Um, this includes coming from the tech companies themselves. And then the, I think the piece that you were harking on, which is still being seen in, in, in a dismissive way, is not only the disinformation and digital voter suppression that we're talking about, but the way in which that, you know, that, that, that we, these reporters were able to go and point out actual people and somehow we're not doing anything about that. That somehow we're still looking at data as if it's just numbers and not people. And 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 what the what that um that re that special report did was basically say, here we can actually take you to the people, and they got to see their own profiles. And that's a problem because we also need to say uh, or admit to the fact that the data is out there now. It's in the wild. And what are we gonna do about that data that's in the wild? Those people who we know that, that, the, that the, uh, the media went to who were willing to speak to them, imagine, what was it? 3.5 million people were targeted for deterrence. Um, we're talking about 3.5 million people who have their election integrity at risk. Um, the, the, the key piece here, I think this also being missed is that the same type of information um, was, was, was being used for hacked material, right? 
we know from 2016, it wasn't just a hack material from the DNC, it was hack material from the DCCC. Um, we, we saw that other candidates' campaigns be affected where, where hacking material was being used in campaigns. Uh, a one woman in, in Miami, for example, um, was targeted as well. She lost her race because her uh, opponent was, was, was showed up to a, a, um, a debate with her uh, data in, in, in printed form to present to everyone else. Um, so, so, so that's a problem that we like, that should be illegal as far as I'm concerned, right? How is that even possible that we're not addressing that? So we're looking at two versions of this in terms of our data privacy that's being collected on us, but also those that's being hacked and being used uh, in, in, in uh, electoral debates. I think that's a problem that we have not faced in this country. And we're literally moving to the next election where we didn't address any of this for the last couple of years. Thank you, Shun. That's really interesting. So my question to the panel would be, given that the voter suppression that's happening across the state is specifically targeting minorities and diverse communities, or uh, the data is, for example, which is used allegedly to boost voter turnout in certain rural communities um, across the states, um, what are the consequences for the integrity of our elections uh, in both the UK but also the United States? And you know how can we how can we start coming up with a system where our elections and our democracy can be safeguarded and protected? Um, from my perspective, we have not done the work to do anything about that. We 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 still we still have people denying that the Mueller report uh, indicated there were Russian interference. Like we we have a fundamental flaw here about it addressing an issue that some of us are still pretending doesn't doesn't even. Is, isn't even happening, or they're coming up with other state actors, um, you know, like China or um, Iran to, to, to deflect from what's happening. Because what China's doing around intellectual property issues, which I think are, are important issues to have conversations about, um, i.e. in some instances, privacy issues, are not the same thing as interference in our elections or into our systems or trying to deter voters. Those are completely different conversations. And somehow everyone wants to flatten them as, as if they're equal. And if you do that, then we don't have an answer or we don't have the work to do the focus on trying to address this. So at this point across the board, um, we have not taken any actions here, um, and that's a problem, which is why I'm, I'm sitting here in front of you saying this has to change. And by the way, if we haven't done it from 2016 to 2020, it's going to be a, an, an integral part of our election system from this moment on. I've seen other campaigns take on the same behavior of what the Russians were doing in 2016 on a domestic level. We don't even need Russia at this point. We're doing it. So I suppose kind of the question is that do we need legislation? And if so, what type of legislation? Of course we need legislation. But if politicians who are there are okay with this activity, are they going to put that legislation together? I mean, that's part of our fundamental problem here, the cycle of, of electing people in office and those in office who are okay with, the, with the, these types of systems because they benefit them. Um, the answer is yes, we need legislation. But how do we get there? I think, Shirin, that's exactly the part I was actually going to say as well, because you could, when you think about companies like Cambridge Analytica and that industry around political consultancy, who are their clients that are weaponizing this data? The data is not just sitting there neutral. Somebody's weaponizing it and using it. It's the political parties that are, are weaponizing it and using this data. And we live in a country in the UK where we have laws over the use of data and political data particularly, but we know from our work with Open Rights Group and litigation with Open Rights Group, that the political parties have a very expansive definition of what they think they can do with data. They've said to us they can do anything that helps them win an election, which effectively means nothing. There's no restraint on what we can do. So until there's some enforcement of the, those rules and some setting of parameters as to what's permissible, and until we start to say to political parties, you, this is not a free for all, this is going to continue to be a problem. These data sets are getting richer rather than getting smaller. And I think a related problem with that is, as Dave was talking about, the internationalization and the lack of symmetry and protection. And if we end up having different laws with different standards in different places, all that's going to happen is profiling is going to go offshore to different jurisdictions. And we're going to be constantly chasing the tail of these data practices. And we really need an international harmonization of data protection to ensure all of our democracies are not for sale in the same way. Another tragic realization of going through the process is how 
the how business law enables loopholes that protect the corporation at the expense of individual rights and voters and the electoral process. So in the way that insolvency law and bankruptcy law in the US created a mechanism for Cambridge Analytica to be released from its liabilities and complicated our ability to pursue those rights shows how the sort of system has always been built for corporations. And in the enforcement of data abuse related to the political process, um, this became a very convenient me mechanism to evade the liability that could have been substantial. If we had been able to show that every US voter had their data abused because they were politically profiled, then SCL would have had massive liabilities, but they were easily able to escape those liabilities simply by going into administration. And in the case of the US, the LLC, the secret the Delaware company that no one could prove who even owned it was abandoned in bankruptcy court. And so to this day, if you wanted to do Cambridge Analytica again, simply make a secret company, collect the abuse, and when you uh, collect the data, conduct the abuse, and when you get caught, just go out of business. Uh, we haven't closed that loophole. And so, I mean, even with the best laws on the books and even with muscular regulators, there are still many loopholes to close. With regards to the United States, California, passed the California Consumer Privacy Act. And in many ways, the Cambridge Analytica scandal created the basis to pass this law. And I've been told by advocates and lawyers in the room when the tech companies were, and their lobbyists were trying to quash this, uh, this state law, that the advocates all only had to say two words to get the tech companies to be quiet. And it was Cambridge Analytica. That the scandal for all the damage that it caused created um, a, uh, a mechanism to achieve reform that would have otherwise not been possible. So that's the silver lining of it is that without Cambridge Analytica, we would not have had a radical rethinking of tech pl platforms and their political power. We would not have had the ability to achieve some reform at the state level in the US. And interestingly, another ballot measure is, is on the ballot in California to further upgrade the California Consumer Pri Privacy Act to further strengthen it and close loopholes. And there's kind of an interesting debate going on against advocates and proponents of uh, the CPRRA, which would do things like create a data protection authority uh, in California and uh, would not exempt political ca campaigns. Um, well, well, one of the, the, the controversies around it is that it does not allow for private action, so individuals can't sue. And it is still an opt-out model as opposed to an opt-in model, which is generally one of the most significant differences between the European and the US, and, or rather the North American privacy regime. So there's interesting mo movement happening in the US. And I would also surmise that if Democrats take control of Washington DC by winning the Senate and the White House, that the prospect of a national privacy law being passed in the coming year or years increases very substantially because the industry wants a national law, it does not want a patchwork of state laws. And so we could see some, some, some fast, relatively fast reform in the US depending on the results of the election. And so those are things to look out for and of course, Things like the Schrems II decision that toppled Privacy Shield create further incentives to achieve GDPR adequacy 
So to, to sort of create that level playing field or, or international standards, we, in an optimistic view, we could see the industry backing a democratically controlled Washington DC to create a national privacy law that is stronger than the California law and closer to the GDPR. Will we get to opt in versus opt out? I have no idea, but um, this is an optimistic view of where we could go from here. Now, um, there was one uh, very interesting metaphor, which I think the credit for that needs to go to Ravi, uh, which when he described some of these practices and likened it to international piracy. Um, there is one which I have seen um, over the recent weeks and months, whereby some of the tech giants, namely one of them specifically, has been likened to East India Company. Um, any of you have any views on that? I'll just have to j jump in that um, the disgraced CEO of Cambridge Analytica SCL, Alexander Ashburner Nix, his family descends from the East India Company. So he is colonialist to the core. And uh, in many ways, SCL is a colonialist enterprise or was in its notion that British aristocrats felt that they had an entitlement to meddle in the affairs of other countries and to infiltrate their go governments. So um, I think it was Christopher Wiley who first sort of made the accusation that we're dealing with a form of digital colonialism here. Uh, and so, yes, uh, it, it is not only Mr. Nix's family genealogy, but it is in many ways the business model. Uh, infiltrate elections to then infiltrate good governments. And in many ways, I felt that I was sort of offended when I first discovered that Cambridge Analytica was British as an American feeling like, why is Britain interfering in my elections? That, that it wasn't just R Russia, it was what is Britain doing? Um, so there is a kind of colonialism here that uh, gets brushed under the rug, but it's pretty much the business model. Uh, just one quick thing to add to that. David's point was absolutely right. I think one other thing to add, just like the East India Company was a royal endeavor funded by the state, you've got to keep in mind that a lot of the technology that interferes with our worldwide democracies was funded by the American government. And it often gets overlooked how much support there was at that stage when this was all nascent. Um, let's not keep that out of focus as well. I mean, one of the things that was always said to me when I talked about digital voter suppression was that um, what is different <clears throat> about what Russia did versus what um, American politicians do. And there's a good question about that. And, and the next question is, what are we going to do different about that? Um, we're willing to sort of speak about Cambridge Analytica and, and foreign interference, but we're somehow not willing to do that with our with ourselves. Um, I, you know, there's there's a lot to be said here, um, but there's a lot of actions that need to be done as well. Uh, yeah, um, I wanted to uh, know, uh, Shun, obviously you've done quite a lot of investigation going back several years with regards to voter suppression that's occurring in and around America. And uh, you've uh, explained what's going on with regards to the this cycle of presidential uh, election. Um, are there anything else that in particular extremely worries you. I mean, I know you've pointed out some of them and you've explicitly mentioned how it all started even in January before we knew Biden was the presidential candidate, but also in the context of um, some, of the, uh, some of the minority communities in the States being strongly in favor of Biden, namely the African-American community, but also given that Biden's running mate, uh, Senator Harris, um, uh, is obviously from uh, an African-American and an Indian background. How do you see that voter suppression operation at the moment, given that we know who the candidate um, uh, and who the vice presidential candidate is? Yeah, so we tracked um, Kamala Harris two weeks before she made her first announcement, which was in January. 
uh, we know this, this this uptick again because of the work that we do focusing on looking at this type of thing, looking at what's happening in the communities of color, particularly online, looking at um, online harassment and, and violence in our communities and how platforms respond or don't respond, by the way, to them, how they're sort of banned and suspended for defending themselves or taking any action whatsoever. Um, and, I, and I have so many stories to say about that in terms of the stories that we have had reported to us about the things that, um, that that uh, that that uh, Facebook and, and and Twitter will will shut down um, and ban uh, and suspend uh, you know users on these accounts for saying things like white people or colonizer by the way <laughs> David <laughs> because we happen to be black or brown um, but somehow that you know uh, the n word or calling us you know animals or apes or whatever is fine um, and that's that's the systemic you know. Um, problem here. But I want to make sure that you understand that when I say this in, in, in context of Kamala, that we saw that originally, we, we, we saw the uptick that came from um, uh, uh, her, her black identity first, which was a lot of um, people basically saying she wasn't black, right? Um, because she has this mixed background, which is ironic, because in America, we have the one drop rule that still exists. So it does not matter how many other versions you might have, as long as there's one drop of black blood, we still have that as a part of our cultural narrative. So I think it's ironic or why anyone even bother having this debate about that. Um, <clears throat> but the other piece that we see now from 2019, when she had a presidential run to her now with her a VP run, is that we're watching in ways in which uh, her Indian identity is being used as the weapon to, to uh, get people to deter people from elections. That means that the communities of Asian descent are the target in that regard. Um, and I find that very interesting. We've seen more data coming in about that and it's being used not, not necessarily through Facebook or, um, um, or, or Twitter, but through WhatsApp and other chat uh, features, group chats, where people are going in. COVID is one of the big weapons used where people are going in trying to get understanding about COVID or what they should be doing. Um, and then they're being sent messages about telling them not to vote for Biden or Harris, uh, and particularly Harris because of her Indian heritage. Um, so the it, it, so the internal divisions, uh, what we call in our community di diaspora wars, is what we call it in our community. But in other communities, like from South Asian or East Asian um, perspectives, is is different, but it's also the same type of weaponization, and it's also being used, i.e., our identity being used as weapons to um, deter uh, people from voting. Um, and that's what I classify as digital vote suppression. Um, and, these, and even though we were looking at it specifically for African-Americans, we've seen this with native communities as well. We've seen this uh, again now with the Asian community. We've seen this in the Latino community. So we work with other groups that work with, the, with those communities as, uh, in, in addition, but, but we see um, the, 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 the metamorphosis of this type of targeting, especially now with the weaponization of COVID because we're looking at um, places where now they're anti-vaxxers are jumping in our communities because of issues like Tuskegee um, and, and, and vaccines being used as a conversation to get, deter black people because we can't trust the government, right? How do we vote for a government we can't trust? I mean, in some ways that's, that's not untrue <laughs> historically, that's not untrue with this moment that we're in, um, with the things that are happening um, and, and being allowed by uh, government officials, uh, the things that they're trying to debate that you should have the right to do. Um, so there's so that part's true, but it is also being used to weaponize in a way to keep those who should be voting to vote those candidates out um, and, and to exercise our right uh, uh, rights against the government, targeting Black Lives Matter, uh, basically considering the groups that are out protesting for um, police killings uh, out protesting because of which something that just happened in Philly literally days before the election. Um, that, that, that these are things that people are saying are, 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 are being used to say that they are the problems. They're the ones that um, we should be voting against and not voting in support of. Uh, they have been weaponized against other communities and saying, why should we support the black community in any way? Um, even though you know um, voting is one aspect of that. Um, so we've seen different aspects um, in the ways in which um, we've seen target the, the way that black, you know that um, I won't go into the black celebrities, but the way in which the black celebrities have been weaponized by um, by Biden's opponent opponent to basically say that they have the right plan for African Americans when Biden has a twenty eight page document that actually says that, and we're not discussing that that document or any of the other uh, black agendas from other groups that have put those put those things out. So we're watching the ways in which our identity is still being weaponized and who they're telling us we should be trusted, trusting or not. And if they and 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 the truth is that there was an article that came out of the Washington Post that basically said, you know, 
the um the trump campaign came campaign wants black people to vote for him but the truth is he doesn't want them to vote at all i mean that's been the the, the, key, the key to this whole thing at, um from the beginning and so again when i say that you know we were tracking trying to get black people not to vote for the democratic candidate no matter who it was even now with a democratic candidate they're trying to use the same 20 some of the same 2016 talking points like super predator he never said super predator i know we're having a conversation about the crime bill um we're having a conversation about criminal justice but they're trying to twist um some narratives from 2016 into 2020 which isn't what doesn't hold water and isn't true um and the same thing with kamala's record you know we haven't dealt with kamala's record but they're still making um that, that was something we did see in 2019 where they're making um um you know uh, uh um using using her her record in an inappropriate way for for voter disengagement so yeah now that they know they're just using the same thing there was a data poll that was put out before the nominee, where uh, they were deciding uh, if, Bi if Biden, I mean, sorry, Biden, Biden was a nominee before the VP. And they basically said, if Biden was to choose a woman, um, what would people, that people were polled. Um, it was very interesting to watch that polling because we had, by this time, knew it was Biden. So they said a woman or a black woman was the question in the, in the survey. And in truth, everybody was fine in most capacities with a woman in general, but when that number changed to black women, uh, when, when the when the question changed to black women, the number changed changed drastically. Even among black men, it was a thirty point drop in um, from woman to black woman, um, and it was interesting to see that that drop matched uneducated white women, and 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 white men in general. Um, so yeah, the, the weaponization of of this about targeting certain groups. To, towards because Kamala is a black woman is, is very much being used because there's polling data to prove that they can use that um, um, in this in this campaign. Thank you so much, Shreen. Last question is, and I'm not going to ask you to predict the results of the presidential election uh, in a few days time, but what I am going to ask you and um, many of our audience are uh, interested in your views is that what do you foresee, what do you predict, what do you see on the horizon with regards to our digital and data rights? What do you think that's going to be concerning in two or three years time? Thank you. My problem is what I think we already kind of talked about. But the biggest part that I think is, is a problem that we're not addressing, which is what David was talking about, is the data roles, the data, the data that's collected that's connected to the voting roles. Like that to me is one of our fundamental problems that we have not talked about or addressed at all. And, and that's what scares me the next couple of years of us not connecting the dots between those things. Now that we have that data, now that we know we can make those comparisons, now that we know Channel 4 walked into, you know, it, it walked to other people's homes in Wisconsin and basically showed them their data, that to me is a conversation we're not having. It's the same conversation I think we jumped over here when Equifax was breached. Equifax collects data on us. We have no control over that data. We're not inputting that data, but that data is being used for, for, for judgments, i.e. With, um, with money, with loans, with cars, the things that impact our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But somehow we have no say in what, did, what data they collect and how they use it. And even when they breached, when they were breached, they were not held accountable. As a matter of fact, our country gave them more money to kind of fix their breaches from the government. And so we are not looking at this as a way that um, that, that, that has a, 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 a human cost to each and every one of us and what we should be doing to change that going into the next couple of years. I think we're at the tail end of that because of this election, but this, again, when we go into the next couple of years, um, th these are the types of things we have to spend a little bit more energy and time on that I think gets deflected um, and not addressed. Thank you so much, Shereen. I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you. And guys, I, I, I'm so glad to be here with you. I do have to run to the next event, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so glad we could actually do this. David, as always, thank you for everything. Thank you, Shereen. Thank, thank you, Take care. You know, I, I think the Channel 4 journalistic um, technique of showing voters their file and their reaction to it makes a you know really emphasize what Shireen was saying like this these are not numbers these are people and when you watch somebody see their profile you bring the human story to the surface and in many ways 
it shows how the power of the data can be neutralized, that the asymmetry of knowledge can be recalibrated in an instant. So in particular, the two moments in the coverage in Wisconsin that we could look at to, to, to show this importance of the right of access, the right to know, such a simple right that when it is granted, it solves the problem of the asymmetry of knowledge. That when the black woman in Wisconsin was shown her file and she was shown that she was marked for deterrence, her response to, to Krishnan from Ch Channel 4 was, this makes me want to vote even more. That the deterrent effect was inverted through the visibility. Conversely, when a Trump supporting um, mom was shown her file by Krishnan, you could see uh, her body language. She was visibly disturbed by the invasion of her privacy, even by her chosen candidate. That, that making this data visible is the most important thing we can do because it will reduce its power, which is based on the lack of visibility into it. And the minute that you create that visibility, the asymmetry is resolved. And so it's such a simple thing to achieve and can have a disproportionately positive effect. And that's why I focus on this. And that's why all the US really needs to do is to achieve the right of access, enforceable, and we will solve some of our problems. Just to um, add to those excellent thoughts from my fellow panelists. So obviously I'm looking at this from a, a British perspective and I'll start with some pessimistic thoughts and try to end on an optimistic note. Um, so from a pessimistic or slightly worrying perspective, we're, we're obviously about to head into not just Brexit as a theory, but becoming an independent third state, completely independent from the European Union. Our data protection regime is based on European law. It is not a British institution. Our approach to data protection under our current government is to seek to attempt to lessen those protections. The government's on record. We're having consultations about the frameworks of our data protection laws. Our domestic act that implements the GDPR is not probably adequate to provide an adequate level of data protection to compare against the GDPR. There is a real concern that the, one of the sea changes that Brexit will introduce is to allow the UK to act as a data laundering centre with very minimum superficial protections over data. That is a real concern and it's something all citizens in the UK should be aware of and try to push back against. But that does bring me to the point that I feel quite optimistic about, that there is a societal change in understanding about how people see data. As David is very eloquently explained, when people, it's the people that change the way people see data. It's people taking action, it's people enforcing their rights, because rights are hollow unless they're enforced. And it's really important to me as a practicing lawyer that these rights become very real, that people understand that their rights over their data are based in on the conception of fundamental human rights, that data rights are human rights. And when we start to utilize those rights in really effective and meaningful ways, we'll change that power dynamic between those that have our data and those that are subject to it. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful uh, to both of you, and of course to Shreen who was here with us earlier. Thank you so much for your time. And with that answer, uh, we have come to the end of our events on data, democracy, and the integrity of our elections. Thank you very much to our panelists, Shreen Mitchell, the founder of the Stop Online Violence Against the Woman Project and a member of the Independent Facebook Oversight Board, to Professor David Carroll, who's an Associate Professor of Media Design at the Parsons School of Design at the New School in New York, and Ravi Naik, uh, who is a multi-award winning solicitor who served as Professor David Carroll's lawyer um, and has also co-founded the data rights agency AWO, where he serves as the legal director. And of course, many thanks to our members and supporters 
who have carried on and continued supporting us have also sent in so many great questions for their panel. 